Thank you for tuning in to Highland Chapel Online. My name is Nick Calloway. I'm one of the pastors here at HC. We love being able to offer this resource, but please don't let it take the place of gathering with your local church. What a privilege it is to be known, to be seen, and to enjoy the fellowship of believers. But while you're here, we hope that God's Word is encouraging to you and that you'll respond to His message. Have a great day. Have you seated, church? Are you thankful for the Son of God who came to this earth named Jesus Christ? I'm so thankful for Jesus. I'm so thankful that He saved me. If he saved you, are you thankful for him? Amen. What a wonderful God we have. Uh, church, my name is Luke. I'm so uh, thankful to be with you uh, today. I want to get you caught up in where we are as a church. We have these, I call them just seasons. They're around a three-week season. We have them four or five times a year where uh, we start uh, these Sundays in a row kicked off by a new member class. That was during the, the 9 o'clock hour, and I believe we had just over 20 people in uh, the, the new member class. Amen, church? It's awesome. And that is without us advertising it, because when we advertise it, we don't have enough room. Amen? Like, it's a good problem to have. Next week will be uh, what we call baptism class. If Baptism is on uh, your mind and heart. You've trusted in Jesus, but just never followed through in scriptural baptism. Uh, We have baptism class where we talk about what scripture says, about what Jesus said baptism is, what it means, what it stands for, and then we'll follow that up the next week with baptism. We're going to be baptizing a lot of people. You ready to see that, church? I'm ready to see it. God's good. He's still saving people. Amen. He still saves church, and I'm so thankful for that. We're in our message series called Family Gathering, and I want to I bring us up to speed because today is the last day in the series Family Gathering. We opened week one talking about peace. Do you remember that one? We are not supposed to be peacekeepers, but peacemakers, that so many of us are tempted to be peacekeepers. It's not what scripture says. What is a peacekeeper? More than likely, you like to sweep things under the rug. You don't like conflict. And when you walk into that family gathering, you just try to make everybody happy and you don't want to deal with things. You don't want to speak truth. Like you don't want to handle that difficult situation. So you just let it go. But that's not what scripture says. Scripture tells us to be peacemakers, to pursue peace. It's an act of work. It's something that we have to do. Hopefully that was an encouragement to you. Then we talked about marriage. We talked about we're going to be bringing, uh, if you're a married person, we're going to be bringing our marriage to the table and how if given enough time, that family gathering, uh, that social gathering, whatever it is, will expose the condition of your marriage. And we talked about two categories. Either you have a marriage that is uh, growing and it's good and it's healthy and it's pursuing Jesus, both parties, or you've got a marriage that might be a little bit on the rocks. We call that just an unhealthy marriage. And in that sermon, uh, towards the end, we, we, we gave you, uh, I, I guess it was a survey, is the best way to call it. We really encouraged you uh, to respond to that message. And in that survey, there were, there were multiple options, but one of the options was, hey, I, I, need, I need help. Like our marriage needs help. And I just want to brag on you, church, for a moment. Um, we had so many people respond to that. So many people, so many couples said, you know what? We, we, want, to, we want to get ahead of this thing. We don't want this thing to fall apart. We, we, we don't want divorce. That's not what we want. Like we want to, we want to pursue a healthy marriage. Like we, we need help. And so many of you responded to that in some form or fashion. So as one of your pastors, I just want to say I'm proud of you. And thank you for having the, the boldness and the courage to speak up and say, you know what? We need some help because that's difficult. It's difficult to say we're, we're in trouble and, and we need some assistance. So I just want to say thank you for that. And then followed up, Pastor Nick uh, talking about parenting. And we uh, talked all about how we're bringing, like how we're bringing the little ones to the family gathering. And the family gathering, whether we like it or not, will expose us as parents. Can I get an amen, mom and dad? Like it's just gonna, it's just gonna tell us what kind of job we're doing, doesn't it? And Pastor Nick uh, took the word of God and he brought some truths from scripture and talked about how as parents, we need to demand obedience out of our children because if they don't obey you, they won't obey God. Isn't that right, mom and dad? And we looked at biblical parenting and then we brought our grief to the table. 
that was, uh, that was, a, heavy, that was a heavy sermon. And, and we looked at maybe more than normal, the holiday season just brings up this emotion of grief as we're thinking about the ones we, we lost, but we just didn't limit grief to the loss of life. We talked about how we grieve all sorts of things in this life and how there is a proper biblical response to grief that God's word really encourages us to grieve in the right way. And so we looked and we saw what scripture said about how to grieve, then followed by the message uh, last week, which was bitterness. You remember that one? Boy, that one stung a little bit, didn't it? Like if you're just a, a bitter person and you walk into the family gathering, it exposes the bitterness in your life. You're, you're hurt. We, we talked about at the, at the root of bitterness, the cause is pain, like somebody or something like just did you wrong, and, and, and you're hurt. And that bitterness is like that root, and it, it grows deep down in your heart. And it's either growing and active, or it's being actively pulled out. And we talked all about, from the, the Word of God, how to remove the bitterness from our life. And I, I got, a, got a kick out of this. It, it was more than one person throughout this series. They said, man, you must have, you must have a microphone at, at, our, at our family table. Like, you're just, like you just know what we're dealing with. And here's the thing. I didn't have to put a microphone in your house. Why? Because I got a family too. And we are all uh, just a bunch of broken people. Can I get something in the room? Like, we, we, we're broken people. Like, I don't have to just sit in your living room because we're dealing with it too. Like, we just all, here's the deal, we, we all need Jesus, amen? So today, the answer, yes, we looked and saw what Scripture said about each of these, but, but the answer to the brokenness in our lives is the gospel of Jesus Christ. So today, what are we bringing to the table? We're bringing the gospel to the family gathering. We're bringing the gospel, but I want to phrase it this way, or are we, or are we, are we bringing the gospel to the family gathering? The gospel in and of itself can cause some division in the family, can it? Have you ever felt the tension of the gospel at a family gathering? Have you ever felt the tension of, of being a believer? And what I really mean by this is that, that you've surrendered to Jesus. Like you've made him the Lord of your life. You've experienced the joy of forgiveness. You, you've experienced that life change, how he cleanses you from the inside out. Like you're, you're not who you once were. Praise the Lord. And your life is different. And you're, you're different because of Jesus, and then you roll up to Mima's house on Thanksgiving, and you know that you're more than likely going to be outnumbered. Has that ever been you, or is that you right now? And because of the gospel, because of your faith in Jesus, you're the black sheep. Like, you're, you're, you're isolated. You're on the outskirts of the family now because of who you claim. Is that you? Like, have you, have you experienced the divisiveness, the tension of the gospel that it has on a family gathering, i got to be real with you. I was raised in a home that valued Jesus, and I praise God for that. If that's you, you, you need to praise the Lord for that. In, in my immediate home, those that lived under, my, uh, under the roof with me, we, we loved Jesus, we knew that Jesus was a big deal. But the further that that bubble got, like as it grew in the family, uh, uh, Jesus was represented less and less. You know what I'm talking about? And, and because of the gospel, uh, it, it, we, we had tension. There's tension in families because of the gospel. Now we know in scripture that Jesus says, because of me, like if you claim me, the world will hate you. Have you experienced that? But did you know that if you claim Jesus, your family can turn against you? That you can be the one on the outskirts because Jesus saved you. Like if, if that's you, like you, you know exactly what I'm talking about. How it's so difficult to bring the gospel to the family gathering. And if Jesus has saved you, I really believe that you more than likely in your soul want Jesus to save your family. Amen? Like, you want Jesus to invade your family space. Like, you want Jesus to change them 
like he's changed you, but you experience the tension of the gospel, don't you? Like there's some divide there. Did you know that Jesus speaks to the tension and the divide found in the family when one accepts Jesus and the others don't? We're going to read a passage of scripture and you're, you're, you're probably going to think, Luke, like you're reading from a different Bible. So I, I want you to get your Bibles open and I want you to turn there with me. And we'll talk about this tension. We'll talk about the divide of the gospel. Luke chapter 12, 51 through 53. These are the words of Jesus. He said, do you think I have come to bring peace to the earth? Well, yes, because we sing peace on earth and mercy mild here in a couple weeks, won't we? And Jesus says, no. I have come to divide people against each other. Wait a second, Luke. Like, is that in the Bible? Not only is it in the Bible, it's written in red. Like, these are the words of Jesus. He says, from now on, families will be split apart. Awesome. Three in favor of me and two against me, or two in favor and three against. Father will be divided against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, and mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. Luke, that is terrible. Why did Jesus say that? Jesus is speaking about the divisiveness of the gospel. The gospel Absolutely, church, is the greatest story ever told. He changes lives. Like Jesus saves. Jesus redeems. He pulls you out of the pit of darkness and into the light. Like it's the greatest story ever, amen? But at the very same time, it's the most divisive story ever told. The gospel divides. Jesus is saying, if you claim me and you go back home and others don't, it'll split the family. It'll, it'll divide the family because you're either with me or you are not. And the gospel divides. Have you experienced the tension? Have you experienced the tension in extended family? Like when you roll up and you're like uh, the black sheep, the Jesus freak, and they're like, well, here comes the little Mrs. Goody Two-Shoes. You know, everybody be on their best behavior because they're here. Or, or, or maybe let's shrink it down into, into a marriage context where one is faithfully pursuing Jesus and the other isn't. And there's a divide. There's a tension there. Have you experienced it? The gospel divides. The, the gospel separates. And so we feel that tension amongst our own families. And it's difficult. If that's you, like you, you, you're, you're really dreading those family gatherings because you're on the outskirts, I want to speak a word of encouragement to you because if we just stopped right here with what Jesus said uh, in, in the Gospels, you'd be like, man, what, what's, ugh. I want to encourage you. I need you to hang on to this. It won't be on the screen. But if you need to write this down, write this down, that even Jesus' family didn't believe. Okay? I want you to hang on to that. That even Jesus' family did not believe in him. And you think, Luke, you're lying. I'm not. Let's look at the Bible. John chapter 7, verse 5. It says, for even his brothers didn't believe in him. If you look at the scripture in context, they're like, hey, you need to roll back into town, do some more miracles just to prove yourself to them and to us. Because we're, we're just not believing who you are. So if you feel the tension in your family because you believe and they don't and it breaks your heart, Jesus felt the same. Just as we go back to grief, that, that even Jesus cried, like Jesus wept. Jesus knew the disappointment of those around him not believing in him. Like he, he knew that disappointment. He knew the tension. He, he knew what it was like to have some for him and some against him. He knew, he knew the divide. So families will be divided by the gospel. So you might be thinking to yourself, okay, Luke, yeah, we're, we're talking about today, like bringing the gospel to the family gathering, but if Jesus says in his own words that the gospel divides, like the gospel's gonna create tension, the gospel's gonna separate, why should I even bother bringing the gospel? 
Like, why should I even step into that space? If Jesus says it's going to split us, why should I show up and try to share the gospel and split our family even further? Like, we're just getting over Aunt Barb's meltdown last year at Christmas, and, and, now, and now you want me to show up and, and talk about Jesus and divide us even more? Like, what's the point? Or, or you may be thinking this, like, hey, like, Jesus works for me. Like, I've discovered him. He saved me. I love him. He's my Lord, and, and, and it's, 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 they don't feel that way, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hang on to him. I'm going to love him, and I'm just going to show up at the gathering, let them be them, and let me be me. And for so many of us, when it comes to taking the gospel to the family gathering, that's where we end up, that it's just easier not to, that it's just easier week one, to keep the peace. It's just easier for me to be quiet about my faith, uh, to talk about deer hunting, to talk about the Cowboys losing. Yeah, I'm a Cowboys fan, don't like that. Like, it's just easier to talk about that stuff. It's really difficult to talk about Jesus because it's going to divide and I'm just going to be quiet. So why should I even bother taking Jesus to the family gathering? Listen, if you found him and he is your only hope, which he is your only hope, guess what? He is their only hope. So we take Jesus to the gathering. Like we, we live for him in the gathering. Like we, we should share him at the gathering, regardless of the division, regardless of the divide. So I want to encourage you, not all hope is lost. He's given you responsibility, and you say, yes, sir, and you go. And you take the gospel. Great, Luke. Okay, so you told us it's going to divide, but then you told us to do it. Now teach us how. How do I take the gospel to the family gathering? It's going to be on the screen. I want to give you some really practical steps today. How, how, do I, how do I take the gospel? How do I take the gospel to my family in which Jesus says it'll divide? Like, how, how do I do that? What's, what's the steps? How can I make sure that my family knows Jesus? or at least hears about him. The first thing that I want you to write down is you need to love them. You need to love your family. Now, some of you have been thinking, well, that's, uh, you're oversimplifying it, but some of you are going, man, that's tough. Like, it's tough to love family. It's oftentimes easier to love a stranger than own family. Can I get something? Like, it's just tough. Like, it's tough to love them, but you must love them. So here's what I want you to do. When you're thinking about the family gathering, you're thinking about not going, you're thinking about the division of the gospel, like you're the black sheep, like, like when you show up, everybody gets quiet and awkward because there's the Jesus person. Here's what I want you to think. I need to keep loving them. So I want you to show up with a casserole. I want you to make the best casserole you've ever made in your life. I want you to show up with that dish like you always have. Come Christmas time, I want you to keep buying the presents. Like, I want you to walk in, and I want you to demonstrate Demonstrate love to your family because you loving them could be the only believer that they ever see in their life. Love them. Did you hear me? Keep loving them. Now, I could save a whole nother sermon about how to deal with toxic family and when the cutoff is, right? I, that, we're not going there. Let's just pretend they're not toxic. They just don't know Jesus and they mistreat you a little bit because of that. You need to keep loving them. Keep loving them. Keep loving that family member. Keep loving that group. Keep, keep loving them, actively demonstrating the love of Jesus for them. First Peter chapter 4, verse 8 says this. Many of you know this. Most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other. For love covers a multitude of sins. Now, Scripture is not saying that by you showing up and loving them well, they'll be saved. It's not what that is saying. It's saying you demonstrating the love of Jesus covers over the offenses. It looks past the offense. Love is patient, love is kind, love endures, all that good stuff that the Bible says about love. That's what you are demonstrating to them when you love them in their ignorance, when you love them in their mistreatment of you, when, when you love them when they were like, hey man, don't bring that here to Mima's house. Like, you, 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 keep, you keep loving them, church. You keep on demonstrating the love of Christ to your family that doesn't love Christ. 
keep loving them. Why? Because Jesus loves them. Do you believe that Jesus loves them? Then you need to keep loving them too. The second thing that I want you to write down is you need to live it out in front of them. You're like, Luke, that's, that's kind of what we just went over. No, it's not. It's completely different. Even a lost person can love well. Did you hear that? Even a lost person can love. So you love them well, and then you live out your faith in front of them. You, you, you see, a person of faith lives out their faith. Like a, a person of faith is changed by the gospel. A, a person uh, that claims Jesus lives differently even around the family. Do you live differently around the family? Or do you show up at the family gathering, you're like, man, like I've had my, I've had my Jesus hat on all week at, at work, I've had my Jesus hat on at school, like I've had my Jesus hat on in all these things, but when I show up to Meemaw's house, man, I'm just one of the cousins again. You know what I'm saying? No! No! <laughs> Live for Jesus. Many of you are thinking, man, um, what about deer camp? Yes! Live for Jesus at deer camp too. Don't take your hat off. Live for Jesus. Live out the gospel. Be a changed person in front of them. Not only love them well, church, but live out your faith in front of them and see what Jesus does with it. Your faith has the potential to change someone's eternity. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12. We're going to read two powerful passages of Scripture. First Peter says this, be careful to live, what church? That was weak. Be careful to live, what? Properly among your unbelieving family members. Then even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable lives your honorable behavior. They will give honor to God when he judges the world. It very much matters. Please look at me. Please listen. It very much matters how you live in front of your family. Amen? We, we live in such a time that it's even taught from some pulpits that God is good. He forgives. You do you. Jesus forgives you. That's true. But, but Jesus also says, live like you're changed. L live like a redeemed person. Live like a person of faith and live it out even in front of your family. Live out the gospel in front of them. And what Peter says, it could be an example of Jesus in front of them. And they could repent and turn to him, 1 Peter 3. We're going to make this even more specific within the home. 1 Peter 3, 1 and 2. In the same way, you wives must accept the authority of your husbands. Then, even if some refuse to obey the good news. What's he talking about? Lost husbands. Your godly lives will speak to them without any words. They will be won over by observing your pure and reverent lives. What we see here in context is Peter is talking to a wife who has trusted in Jesus who goes home to a divided house. And he says, keep loving him. You see, they would, they would ask him, like, do I need to divorce them because I'm a Christian and they're not? And he's like, no, go back home. Live out your life of faith in front of them. Be such, I'm gonna, it's so cliche, but I need, you to hear, I need you to hear me. Be such a good Christian. That's what he's saying. Be, be such a good, faithful believer in Jesus that your unbelieving husband will take note of your life and potentially repent and come to Christ. So what does that say about Meemaw's house? Show up, love them, love them really well. And then by your life, represent the gospel so faithfully that your unbelieving family will see that you are different. And, 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 and listen, like families go through the same thing together. Like when families grieve, like that lost family member, those lost family members will look at you and go, man, where does your hope come from? Like, like we're, we're coming unwound and you're getting stronger. Like they'll start looking at your faith and, and your faith, what scripture says, your faith has the potential 
to turn their ears and eyes towards eternity in King Jesus. That's power, isn't it, church? Are you, are you living in a way that brings honor and glory to Jesus in front of your family members? Or are you checking out come family gathering time? Live a life that's evident of the gospel. In this particular point, I'll be, I'll be honest, I, I tried really hard to think about, um, what's, the, what's the term, like a, uh, like a practical life story, okay? Because I love sharing life stories with you. Like, I really spent an inordinate amount of time thinking about my own life, my own family. Man, what's a scenario of somebody living out their faith and somebody coming to Jesus or somebody they don't know and all this to, to give you a story? But as I was thinking probably too long about this, I became convicted. Why in the world, Luke, are you trying to think of a personal story when Scripture's full of them? Like, the Bible has these stories about people's faith leading others to Jesus. I'm reminded of the Philippian jailer. Do you remember him? You remember him, church? Okay, so uh, Paul and Silas, they're, uh, they're in chains, like they're in prison. And do you remember what the story says about them? Paul and Silas, they were in prison, uh, in chains, and they were praying and singing. You put, some, you put some chains on me, I'm not gonna be doing that. I'm sorry, your pastor said it. Like, man, like they were, they were in prison at the moment, living, hear me, living out their faith. Like in that moment, they were demonstrating a life that was changed by the gospel, praying and singing. And then if you remember the story of, a big earthquake came, and uh, after it was over, the, the jailer who had been listening to their, their praise and their singing and their prayers uh, was about to kill himself because he thought all the prisoners are going to be uh, like escaped and running away. And then Paul says, whoa, 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 hang on just a second. We're, we're all still here. Do you remember that story? Uh, and he says, we're all still uh, here. And so in awe of their faith, uh, the jailer ran to them, and he says, what must I do to be saved? Do you remember that? You, you see, uh, uh, Paul and Silas, their, their faith was being lived out in front of a lost person. And, and because of living out their faith, man, they were, they were drawn to him. They were drawn to Jesus because of these men's faith. Are you living out your faith in front of your family? Your faith can point them to Jesus. Make sure that you're living it out in front of them. The next thing that I want you to write down is you need to preach it to them. Whoa. Whoa, preacher man. Like, you had me on love them. I can cook pretty good. Like, I was thinking about some dishes that I can make to really share the love with them. Like, I got that. And I can even, like, uh, clean up my behavior a little bit and really live it out in front of them. But you got me on this one. I I'm no preacher. I'm not asking you uh, at the family gathering, if you really want to know how to divide and create some tension, stand up and preach a three-point sermon. Like, I'm not asking you. Like, I'm not asking you to do that, church. I I'm asking you to talk about Jesus. I I'm asking you to share what Jesus has done for you. Has he changed you? Can you talk about the change? Can, can, can you tell them what you once were? Can you, can you share with them, listen, I was a, a wretched sinner, lost and far from God, and he found me in my sin, and he pulled me out of it, and he gave me eternal life, and now I'm full of joy forever and ever. Amen. God, can, can you tell them how you were brokenhearted and, and consumed with grief and bitterness, and you name it, and Jesus found you in that and pulled you out and has given you his joy. Amen. Like, can you tell them of that? Can, can, can you share him, the story, what he's done for you with your family. Let's go back to the Philippian jailer for a moment. The jailer, like we all think, like if you know the story, we think that, that the jailer uh, had that encounter with Paul and Silas and he ran home. If you know the story, we think this is how it goes, that the jailer ran home, he walked in his front door and all his family was instantly saved. And we just think that. Because of what happened to him, he goes home and all this family was saved. We, we miss a crucial point, Acts chapter 16, verse 32. This is what happened. This is Paul and Silas. He said, they, they shared the word of the Lord with him and with all who lived in his household. Then his family believed and they were all saved. 
You, you see, the gospel was shared in the house. The, the word of the Lord was, was shared in the house. Have you ever heard it? Uh, your life may be the only Bible that anybody reads. You ever heard that? It's, tr- it's true, all right? But, but we need to take it a step further than that. Not only live out the Bible in front of them, but share the Bible with them, amen? Church, like talk about it. Talk about Jesus. Now, what am I, what am I asking? I'm not, I'm not asking you uh, to, to, to go there and, and break out the Roman road, because you may not know that, okay? Well, 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 Pastor, I don't even know, like, I don't even know where to find the scriptures. Like, for one, it's time to learn. Let's find out where they are so you can share them, but simply share what Jesus has done for you. Share about his goodness. Share about his grace. Share about his mercy. And his forgiveness. It'd be awesome if you coupled it with the passage of Scripture, but just share Jesus. I'm reminded of another story in Scripture. Do you remember uh, the story of the woman at the well? Y'all remember that one? A woman in some serious sin, okay? Not living that godly of a life at all. Far from the Lord, didn't know Jesus went to the well in the middle of the day so she didn't have to talk to anyone because she was guilt-ridden and shameful. When she showed up there, do you remember who was there? Jesus. And she had an encounter with the Son of Man. And Scripture says that Jesus told her of everything she had ever done. And she met the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, in person at the well And he changed her for all eternity. Amen? Changed her. Saved her. Cleansed her. And I love what Scripture says about what this changed woman did. Do y'all remember what she did? John 4, 29 and 30. She runs back to her town and she says, Come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came streaming from the village to see him. She encountered Jesus face to face. He saved her. He changed her. She didn't run back to her hometown just uh, living a godly life, trying to do everything she can, be a good neighbor, love them well, like live out the gospel in front of them. She was doing all that, but she was saying it. She was preaching it. She was sharing the good news with people. What does Scripture say? They came pouring out to hear the message. Are you sharing what Jesus has done for you? The Great Commission does not say go into all nations living a a godly life hoping people would come to faith. That's not what it says. The Great Commission says go into all the nations teaching them. you got to open your mouth. you got to share the gospel with your family. I know, it's intimidating, isn't it? It it really is. But all I'm asking you is to share what Jesus has done for you. But so often at our family gatherings, for whatever reason, I think we all have our own, we just are silent. We don't talk about him. We honestly kind of start living like them in the moment. And Jesus has never shared. And we know that he's our only hope. And we know that he is their only hope. But we don't share. I want to encourage you. Take the gospel to the gathering. Take Jesus with you this Thanksgiving. Put him in the car. And then when you get there, get him out of the car. And then when you go in and you start having dinner, share him at dinner. Talk about Jesus. Live for Jesus. Love them like Jesus. I want to take you to a random passage of Scripture. You're going to be like, Luke, you've lost your mind. Go to James. Go to James chapter 2. We're going to read a portion of verse 1. And I'll make it make sense, I promise. The excerpt that I have from the book of James 
He says, our glorious Lord, Jesus Christ. Why are we reading this? This is James, the brother of Jesus. Do y'all remember what we started with? That even Jesus' own family didn't believe. But here we have his brother after his life, his death, and his resurrection. Write this about his brother Jesus. He says he is our Lord, Jesus Christ. You see, James was the beneficiary of Jesus being at the family gatherings. For over 30 years, he went to Thanksgiving with his brother. For over 30 years, James watched Jesus love the unbeliever really well. For 30 years, he watched Jesus live out the gospel in front of him and to him. For, for, for 30 years, he heard Jesus preach the gospel like, like I'm the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to me or comes to the Father except through me. Like James heard all of this. So what's the encouragement? That keep taking the gospel to the family gathering. It may take five years. It may take 10, it may take 20, it may take a lifetime. But keep sharing the gospel with your family. And someone in your family could be just like James, that when the time is right, when the seed has been planted, the great harvest will come and Jesus will save them, amen? But take the gospel to the gathering. Be faithful in sharing the gospel. Luke, what is the gospel? You want, me to, you want me to take this? What am I? I don't even know. Like, I don't even know what the gospel is. What is the gospel? It's the story of Jesus. John chapter 3. The scripture says, For God so loved, what? The world. That he gave who? That whoever would believe in him should not, what? But have, what? everlasting life. It's the gospel. That Jesus lived a perfect life on this earth, which means he never sinned. And, and because of his purity, because of his sinless life, he was the perfect sacrifice to be offered up on the cross for our sins. So he willingly gave himself up on the cross to be offered a sacrifice so that you and I could have forgiveness. So he died on the cross. Did he stay dead, church? What separates our Lord from all others is that he rose from the grave and he, and he rolls and reigns in, in heaven. And, and if you trust in the story of the gospel, if you place your faith and hope in him, scripture says, you'll be saved and you can have eternal life. That's the gospel. So if you've never done that, like if you've never trusted in Jesus, like I'm telling you to go take the gospel to your family, but you've never trusted in Jesus, let today be the day that you trust in the Lord. Let me pray for you. God, we love you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the gospel. Thank you for Jesus. God, I pray that we would take your son with us wherever we go. That we would take him with us to the family gathering. That we would know that because of who we claim, there will more than likely be some division. There will be some tension. There will be some awkwardness. But don't let that deter us from sharing the gospel with our lost family. Help us to be found faithful, loving them really well. Living out the gospel that changed us and then preaching the gospel that changed us. 
God, I lift those up that are on our minds and our hearts that we're thinking about that don't know you. I pray that you would invade their hearts and change them for all eternity. And I pray for those in here right now that are hearing the gospel that have never responded. I pray that you would move in their hearts, that you would draw them to repentance, and that they would place their faith and trust and hope in your son, Jesus. Save someone today. In Jesus' name, amen.